We're th thrilled to have Ray Hahn. I'm going to let him uh, tell about himself or whatever he wants to do, but with his presentation, and then we'll have uh, questions at the end. Uh, Ray is uh, a longtime postcard collector. He was introduced to me by Susan Lane, who's here today, and she's kind of the introducer of the hobby, it seems like, anymore. Like the guys in the Western New York Postcard Club, they said, everybody knows Susan, and I think that's true. She's not smiling, so I hope she's hearing this. <laughs> there she is. Anyway, thank you, Ray, and I'm going to turn the uh, microphone over to you and let you uh, show us your amazing, wonderful uh, uh, cards. Well, thank you, Hal. It's a privilege to be here today. I've uh, attended all of your Zoom meetings, and I've been fascinated by the, the logistics of it all. And um, I thought this would be a good opportunity to introduce some of my postcard friends to a set of cards that I've collected for over 30 years. And in an attempt to uh, placate myself, um, I've decided that an illustration is worth a thousand words. So let me start out immediately. I'm going to share my screen and I'm going to show you a slide from a, a PowerPoint presentation that um, will probably explain a lot of what is happening uh, in, in today's presentation. Um, one of the things that um, I find uh, somewhat amusing and amazing at the same time is the comparison between this, the country of France and our home country of the United States. Uh, when I first started traveling in France, so say 22 years ago, 20, 32 years ago, uh, I was amazed at the size of the uh, of the country. Uh, as you can see off to the right there, there's a dot on a map and it says Millville. And it shows its comparative location with Wichita. And I've overlaid a map of the country of France on top of Kansas. And as you can see, Kansas is 500 and, or, France is 590 miles wide and 600, uh, 600 miles almost to the, to the mile um, from north to south. And it's interesting to, to learn that as you travel in France, you have to admit that when you travel in a country that large, that it's a grand investment in time. And what is, what is amazing about that time is the fact that you can shorten it all by riding the rails, by buying a train ticket and getting on a train. And in, in France, about 85% of all the train traffic today is super high speed um, trains that travel as fast as 160, 170 miles an hour. So it's very interesting to find that when you're in France, you can get to your destination if you're riding a train almost as fast or at least half the time uh, as it would take you to drive there. The, uh, the cards that you're going to see today are basically train tickets. When, uh, when we get to the appropriate place in, in the presentation, I'm going to point out to you that one end of the card is serrated. And it's that way because when you bought your ticket in France, you would tell the, the gatekeeper, so to speak, your destination, you'd pay your fare, he'd give you a ticket. The ticket was usually about eight inches long and uh, standard postcard width. And at the one end, the perforated end would be a stub. So you buy the ticket, you board the train. As soon as you get to the train, 
you give the conductor the stub. That's your train ticket. And he will help you find your seat. And the rest of the ticket is a postcard of your destination. And it has a beautiful illustration done in some cases by world famous artists. Now, we're going to begin our trip, but before we do that, I'm going to get ready to be French. Here we go. This presentation is entitled On the Rails in France and Beyond. The <clears throat> The whole concept of this program is going to be collecting Chemin de Fer postcards. Chemin, what's that word mean? Well, it's a path. Fair the French word for iron. So it's an iron path. It's an original presentation. I've created it just for you for presentation today. And it will be my pleasure to tell you how it all began. It was 1991. I was in London, England at a postcard show on Greycoat Street. And I met an old friend of mine by the name of Alfie Harris. And Alfie asked me as we were settling up that day, uh, what are you gonna do after you leave the fair? Where are you going after, you, after the postcard show? And I told him that my wife and I were going to be going to France because I wanted to see the Bayeux Tapestry. Now for anyone who's not familiar with the Bayeux Tapestry, it's an embroidery done around the year 1250. And it depicts the, um, the Battle of Hastings. And it starts with uh, William the Conqueror leaving his home in France, going across the English Channel and landing in Hastings and fighting for the countryside to become his own. And if you look at the example on the left-hand side, you'll see images that imitate the, the embroideries on the Bayeux tapestry. So Alfie was sort of amused by the fact that we were going to go to, to, to France, but Alfie worked for a man by the name of Dr. Richard Moulton. And Dr. Moulton was a postcard dealer, and he overheard my conversation with Alfie. And he says, well, you know what? I have a card of Bayo. He says, you're really going to like it. So he went somewhere, came back in about 20 seconds, and he handed me the card that you see on the left. The border, of course, as I just told you, is part of the Bayo tapestry. And the scene in the center is the big famous cathedral in Bayo. So off we went, we saw the tapestry. I had the first card of a brand new collection. If you look a little bit at the history of um, these postcards, you'll discover that uh, today, most of the French railroad traffic is high speed passenger traffic. Uh, but uh, all those rails are owned by the state as as far as uh, up until the last time I, I checked. And uh, the, the, the train service is fast, it's not expensive, and it's a great way to go green. There, there are no, uh, uh, no sp sp smoke spewing engines anymore or coal burners or wood burners. They're all electric or diesel traffic. And it's really, a great way to travel. The, uh, the yesterday part of the history story is that 
Yesterday, and I'm talking about 1902 to about 1929 or 1930, um, yesterday the, the, the trains in France operated basically the same way they do today, with one single exception. Each and every one of the, the districts of France were divided up according to uh, a different administrative code. And the eight administrative codes that were used in those days are the Chemin de Fer, Alsace de Léon. Uh, I'll, I'll say them in English. Um, the trains of the East, the trains of the West, and to Brighton, the trains of the North, the trains of the PLM. PLM stands for Paris, uh, Lyon, and the Mediterranean. There were also uh, one division that ran only uh, trains within an area called Orléans, and there were trains that went from Paris to Orléans, and there were the trains that went to the West. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to break down the, the different districts and show you example cards from, from each of those districts. But I thought you might like to know why I was so interested in these cards and uh, how it came to be that, that uh, I, I started to collect them. When I was a young boy uh, in my early teens, my uncle would frequently take me with him to the local Elks Lodge. And the, uh, the reason for that was that he liked to play cards on Mondays and Thursdays. And there were times when uh, I would stay with my aunt and uncle after school or in the summer times, and uh, I got to ride along. So one of the fascinating things about the Elks Lodge was that it was a three-story Victorian home that once belonged to the editor of the, uh, the local newspaper. And the house was decorated with all kind of wonderful art and where there were no uh, art selections on the wall, there were bookcases full of all kinds of interesting books. And I got, this, I got the run of the house at the time. So I could look at the art, I could read the books, and I was allowed to sit in the, sit in the smoking room while my uncle was playing cards. Well, it was during that time that I, I developed interests in art and travel, and I even learned some poetry in those days. And what fascinated me historically was the fact that I learned by reading those books that the French the French were the very first American allies. They took our side in the Revolutionary War. And because of that, and it was probably a selfish reason, but I wanted to learn everything I could about the French. I wanted to learn about their society. I wanted to learn about their geography. I wanted to learn about their history. I even wanted to learn about their food. And consequently, when Dr. Moulton handed me that card back in 1991, I it was necessary to begin collecting Chemin de Fer postcards. Here is the region of the first card, and I hope you can see my cursor because I'm going to be pointing out uh, some areas on the map that's important for you to understand uh, where these cards are coming from. This region is called Nord, Belgique, or North and Belgium. Here is Calais all the way up at the top of the country and the city of Lille. And these cities are primarily the cities north of Paris, which is here, which we all know as the country. Um, Rouen is here, La Havre, and in some cases, uh, Caen and Cherbourg are places that we know uh, from, from history. And one of the most fascinating cards uh, from this part of the country is the fact that in the very, very southern edge of Belgium, there is a town called Dinant. 
Now I'm gonna go back to this first slide and tell you that the train traffic out of Paris to the north leaves from the Saint-Denis train station, Gare Saint-Denis. Uh, one line carries all the traffic north to the next city, Aines, and from there, the trains branch out both west and east, and the East Fork goes into Belgium and terminates in Brussels. Uh, today, a lot of the advertisements for travel uh, tell you that Denny is the most perfect location or the most popular destination in all of Europe. And when you get to uh, Denny, uh, you'll, you'll find a rock formation that looks very much like this. It's right down the street from the railroad station. And the interesting thing is that on the card, you don't get the full appreciation uh, of the, the rock placement, but on the, uh, the painting, uh, which comes from 1820, you'll see that they, there is a separation between the large rock on the right and the sort of a pyramid rock on the left. This is called Roche Bayard. This all goes back to a battle many, many years ago. And the Belgians uh, were, were fighting their, their traditional enemies. And one of the Belgian leaders had a, a horse called Baird. And Baird was a tremendously big horse. He could not walk through the crack in the mountain. So legend tells us he kicked it. The horse kicked the rock out of the way and it moved just enough to let the horse walk through. And when the horse walked through, the army walked through. And when the army walked through, they won the battle. Charming legend, isn't it? Alsace and Lorraine, we hear all about those two areas of France from our war history. Alsace was a region in the Northeast and it, it sat primarily in the Rhine River Valley and it had borders with Spain or with uh, Germany and Switzerland. Lorraine is also in the Northeast, but a little further East and it borders with Belgium, Luxembourg and Germany. Here's a card that shows the, uh, the river, the Rhine River Valley in the area. And it suggests that it's the perfect place to visit during the season of summer. Here are two cards uh, announcing the capital cities of, um, of Alsace and Lorraine. Uh, one on the left is Strasbourg, which is the capital city of Alsace, and Lorraine is the capital city of Lorraine. Beautiful cards, absolutely fascinating cards. And what makes these so unique is the fact that each and every card is identified by the name of the railroad district that it represents. Back when I showed you the list of the eight districts, well, 99% of all the cards have the name of the railroad district across the top. So in this case, we find Chemin de Fer de Seis et de Lyon. Lorraine, I'm sorry. Here's a card from Metz. Metz is a city in, in, the, uh, in the Lorraine area district, and uh, it sits along the Sill River, and it has a beautiful Gothic cathedral there and some of the most magnificent stained glass. If you can see my cursor again, I'm pointing at the rose window in the cathedral and you're, you'll be amazed at how big that window is if you have ever had an opportunity to visit this, this cathedral. The next region is the east. The east is, is in this area. Uh, if, if you can see my cursor, I'm pointing at Schorburg or, or Strasbourg and the mountains just to the south and as far east as uh, Trion, down to Dijon, the mustard capital of the world. And uh, 
the, this whole area north of the Jura Mountains in Switzerland, that, that border uh, uh, with Switzerland. And in this area, uh, you'll, you'll find a lot of mountains with forest, co uh, forest covered uh, hillsides. And one of the big industries there, of course, is, is lumbering. The, uh, the, the mountains um, are basically um, equivalent to what we would, we would call the, uh, the Appalachian Range here in, in Eastern America. And um, it's known for logging. And uh, in the card, you can see that there's a, a logger who is taking his cuttings to, to market and he's bringing them down off the hill uh, on a very well organized um, step ladder. And he's moving that, uh, that sleigh down, down, the, uh, down the ladder and he's doing it all by the strength of his own back. I want to direct your attention all the way up to the top part of this card over in the right hand corner. Do you see those perforations all the way across there? That's where your ticket stub would have been attached to this postcard. So when you bought this ticket, you got your stub, you gave that to the conductor, and you had a postcard in your hand on the train so that you could address it to a friend or family or loved one while you were traveling. Here's a card from the same area that shows the headwaters of the Seine River. And uh, it goes all the way down, uh, the river goes all the way down to the, uh, the North Sea. And um, it, it shows pretty much the, uh, the Delta area for the Seine River. And it, uh, it flows uh, past the city of Rouen to the city of Havre. I'd, I'd like to stop for just a minute and talk to you about the language of France. Um, one, of the, one of the interesting things about language is that it's, it's very difficult for a non-speaking individual to, to learn uh, foreign languages to the extent that they're proficient and, and can actually converse in those languages. And there are, of, there are of course, two elements of, uh, of a language that um, are probably the most difficult, the most difficult way of learning a language is, is by learning to spell it and, and learning to pronounce it. Um, languages long ago were, uh, were standardized. Um, English was standardized in, in the, in the, in the Shire of Oxford at the university, at the University of Oxford. And it was fairly recently, 1884. Um, French, however, was standardized by the, uh, the uh, Académie Française. It was an organization of scholars in Paris. And in their standardization of their language, they created something called the Catholicon. Now the Catholicon was a was in essence a dictionary, and dictionaries uh, help you learn to pronounce things. But if you don't understand the spelling, it makes it very difficult to learn how to pronounce. The Catholicon was actually created in 1499. That was almost four centuries before English was standardized. So. When it comes to pronunciation of French, please forgive any faux pas of mine because I simply do not know how to pronounce most of these words. I've learned some, but I don't know them all. And if you have better pronunciations of any of the words that I mispronounce, I'll be glad to learn from you. Also in the Eastern area of the, of the, uh, the country of France, is a uh, is a river valley that is lined with the kinds of buildings you see on this card. It's called the Tway River Valley, 
and it's uh, it's quite a uh, quite a delightful area because it's easily easy to drive, and the distances are short. And then, within the same region of the east, we have a division of the railroad called Eta. And the Eta railroads are the ones that belong to the state, and they frequently overlap the, uh, the directional uh, divisions. Here we have two cards of the same place, Mont Saint-Michel. If you've ever been to France on a guided tour, it's likely that you've visited this place. It's a wonderful location. And uh, what is so magical about it is, is it, well, 12 hours a day, it's an island, and 12 hours a day, it's a peninsula. The tides are high, and they, there's a causeway out there now on a parking lot right at the bottom of the, uh, the coastline there. Uh, but uh, it's, it's somewhat fascinating to be there as the tides are rolling in, and you're wondering if you're going to make it back to the mainland in time. Day and night. The set of um, cards that were presented to their customers by the Chemin de Fer de Paris in Orleans included such places as Pointe Ferrat, out on the Atlantic coast, and for, further out um, in a place called Finisterre, there is a, uh, a transport center that enables you to travel out to the Channel Islands the island of New Jersey and Guernsey, and uh, to name two. And in that town, there's the Basilica of Saint-Paul-de-Léon. And it's a fascinating, fascinating Gothic uh, cathedral. Uh, recently uh, renamed a basilica. Uh, the region of Lyon, Lyon is down here. Uh, just a little bit west of the Alps Mountains. And in the Alps, there's a place called Grenoble. Uh, I'm sure if you are an, an Olympic enthusiast, you know the name Grenoble. Uh, the Olympics were held there several years back. And uh, the scenery is unparalleled, unparalleled. Here are, here's a card from... Um, the Chateau Guillon. And Guillon is a commune. It's a, a holiday destination. And of course, as you can see back here in the Alps, you can see ski areas. And there's a beautiful chateau there that you can visit. And what happens is that uh, you get to to reach this area as, as easily by riverboat as you do by train. It's right on the banks of the Rhone River. Also in the area is Aix-les-Bains. Aix-les-Bains is a, a, a fascinating place, a, just a little bit uh, uh, north of, um, of Nantes, and the, uh, the village is on a uh, lakeside. Beautiful, beautiful countryside. And if you follow the uh, PLM all the way down to the Mediterranean, you come to a place called Monaco. We all know Monaco. Uh, there was a family there by the name of Renio, and that family. Uh, connected with a family in Philadelphia by the name of Kelly. We all, well, those of us of a certain age can remember a wedding that took place between Prince Renier and uh, Grace Kelly. Today, Monaco, of course, is remembered because it has a, uh, a famous uh, Formula One car race that goes right through the center of the town. Uh, they also have international casinos where anybody over the age of 16 can either win or lose their money, depending on their luck. 
And I think one of the things that makes Monaco most famous worldwide is the fact that there are more millionaires live in that square mile than any other place on earth. And why is that? They have no taxes in Monaco. Wouldn't you love to live in a place with no taxes? The region of Orléans is this region in here underneath or south of Paris. It goes as far east as Rennes, includes Le Mans, Tours, Bruges, Trion, this area. When you take a train from Orléans, they say you can reach seven cities. Well, that's partially true. Um, it's true in that you can reach seven cities, but you can also reach a great many more uh, on the way to one of the seven cities. If you care to go to Bordeaux, where you'll find some of the finest wine country in all of France, you'll be able to visit the, uh, the beautiful cathedral in, in, uh, in Bordeaux, uh, which sits right along the, the Garonne River, and you'll be able to visit the rocks of Gunpac uh, that stand guard over the Dardone River. Equally beautiful is the cathedral in Bruges and the, uh, the village of Eusergy. Eusergy is the, uh, the home of the Lemonzine baths. Uh, Saltwater baths uh, been a, a destination for generations. Among the other, two others among the seven cities are the, the city of Po, which is almost down to the border of Spain, uh, sits just north of the, the Pyrenees Mountains, and the city of Terrain, where the uh, Chambord Chateau is located. It's the first. Uh, architecturally designed chateau to include, uh, to include a uh, double spiral staircase. If you have ever seen it, you'll, you'll never forget it. Uh, two cities of uh, Albi and Ambois complete the seven, this list of seven. Um, once again, there always seems to be a river, there always seems to be a cathedral. And there always seems to be a castle or a chateau, no matter where you go in France. And these two cities have all of the above. The next region is the region of Paris to Orléans. And this is particularly small compared to some of the other regions. And we're going to look at, at the city of Paris here, and we're going to go only about an 80 mile radius between Paris here and Orléans. In this region, there are five of the world's favorite destinations. One is the Chateau Chanceau. In Chanceau, the landscape, the architecture, the food, the atmosphere, the weather, and everything else ask you to fall in love. At Cahors, there's a bridge. The legend in the in the in the area says that uh, if you're a lover and you walk to the center of the bridge and exchange a kiss, you're going to be lucky for the rest of the day. One of the interesting things about French law is that in 1910, the French passed a law that you could not kiss in a train station or on a train platform. But the people of Cahors. They had their own legends to deal with. You can also go to Nantes. The Chateau at Nantes is a challenge as well. If you can count the rooms without losing track, you win a prize. Also part of the Orléans area, the, uh, the peninsula of Finisterre, which of course means the end of Earth, the end of territory. There is a, 
a little island right off the, the coast of Finisterre where you'll find some of the most beautiful beaches in all of Europe. And if you're a tourist, you can go out there and worship the sun. But if you're a native, you worship the sea and its bounty. Plein bain. If you worship God, your pilgrimage is rewarded with pearls from the sea and gems from the heavens. And beyond, where the tracks meet the sea, there are probably as many places that are influenced by France as, uh, as you can count on both hands. And if you don't go uh, as far as you want to in France and you come to the sea, you can continue to trip your trip by going by sea. If you can't do it, chemin de fer, you do it by la mer. If you're going west, you can go to London. And if you're headed to London, you go through Brighton. One of the interesting things about the Chemin de Fer postcards from this neck of the woods, from this uh, perspective, um, I'm going to skip this one and come back to it in just a minute. One of the uh, one of the sets of cards, here's another one that shows the per perforations very well. Uh, one of the sets of cards were, uh, were cards that were drawn by uh, a couple of French artists. And um, if you're familiar with, uh, with some French artists, uh, this one uh, will be familiar. Uh, because it was the, the work of Julien Alexander Grun. Uh, you can see his signature down in the right hand corner. And another card artist that uh, you probably are familiar with if you've collected Tux postcards is Maurice Toussaint. So the French artist did British artwork for the Chemin d'Affaires. I'm gonna go back to, um, well, I think I am. I'm, I'm sorry here, wait a minute, bear with me. I'm gonna go back to this card. Um, on one occasion, I was sort of curious to know, you know, if, if, this, if this traffic between, uh, between France and, and Belgium was so uh, uh, so much of an a part of, of daily life in, in certain areas of time, I wanted to know how you went about it and how much it cost. Well, I learned that most of the, the, the French train service uh, to points west, like Brighton and, and London, departed from Gare saint -Lazare. That's the saint Lazare train station. The trains left there daily and they left several times each day. So with a little bit of research, I discovered that uh, the fares in 1912 uh, for a first class ticket was 72 francs. That was about $6 of our money. And uh, you also had an option to buy second class or third class. Now, if you went third class, you didn't exactly ride with the baggage, but um, second class and, and first class. First class was really classy. Second class was standard train travel. So travelers from Paris often met their British friends at the Tower Bridge, seen on the left, with a bobby in evidence. And I think if you look real closely in this area, you can actually see a horse-drawn carriage coming through, coming across Tower Bridge. So, we've gone west, now let's go east. Switzerland, if you wanted to go to Switzerland, uh, you would follow the tracks, and the tracks followed the waters of the Rhone and the Po rivers. 
If you wanted to go further east, you could go to Genoa, you could go to Milan, Venice, or Trieste. One of the interesting things about the history of the, uh, the railroads in the east was that in, uh, in 1882, they decided they were going to build a tunnel um, through the Alps, and they were going to name it after St. Gothard. And on New Year's Day, 1882, uh, they completed that tunnel, and uh, train traffic almost doubled for years afterward. Uh, people wanted to ride through that, through that tunnel. Uh, to a destination in the east. If you wanted to go south, you could go into the Pyrenees, you could cross the Pyrenees, you could go down the Iberian Peninsula to Spain. Unfortunately, there was only one train that went to Portugal. Uh, so if you went down the peninsula, uh, you, you probably wound up in Spain. I might point out that the uh, the card on the right, advertising the Paris Orléans railroads uh, of France, and those railroads having a Spanish destination, you'll observe that that card is actually printed in English. I think I'm just going to leave it at that. If you wanted to go further south, you could cross the Mediterranean into Morocco. There you would have uh, a choice of destinations in Fez or Marrakesh. Or if you wanted to, you could go all the way out west to the Atlantic coast to the cities of Rabat and Casablanca. If you didn't want to go that far south, but you wanted to go a little south, southeast, you could go to Algeria with connection in Algiers and Oran. World War II students will remember that Oran was the destination for the American Army, uh, or the embarkation uh, location for the American Army when, uh, when they invaded uh, North Africa, trying to chase the, uh, the German Army out of North Africa. And of course, Oran was the landing station for a fellow by the name of George Patton, who went over there and took command of things in 1942. Uh, other destinations uh, in North Africa uh, are uh, places that at the time were romanced as being the magical and glorious lands of Islam. And those two countries were Tunisia and Egypt. And if none of those places suited you, uh, you could probably get to wherever your dreams would take you. So before I say adieu, I'd like to take you back to the beginning. I wanna take you to where it all began. Now I'm not talking about my talk, my lecture, I'm talking about creation because legend tells us that twas at Quiberon, where God stood outside the grotto at the end of the sixth day. He didn't say it to anyone particular, but it was there that he said, here is where I want the French to live. So that's glorious legend and fun to tell, but I don't know whether it's true or not. So I say this is the end, and thank you. I'd like you all to go out and collect Chemin de Fer postcards, enjoy their beauty, and it has truly been my honor to give you this lecture. Oh, thank you so much, Ray. That's just wonderful. I wish you could hear us clapping, but anyway, we thank you. And it's just uh, anybody that's traveled and gets to go around, it just uh, brings back memories or you know these places through postcards and uh, videos and so forth. And isn't it a wonderful series?
it'll make me look closer at Susan Lane's cards the next time I'm with her or <laughs> with Dennis Gorham. You know, he probably has two boxes of them. But uh, how many are there, Ray? I, I can't answer your question, Hal. I don't know. Okay. But after I had been collecting these for about five years, uh, there was a dealer, or there is a dealer who lives in Holland. His name is Ron DeBeal. Some of you might have sure uh, might know him or have dealt with him. And uh, he he constantly looked for Sham Mandeville postcards for me. And one day I finally I said to him, Hey Ron, how many of these are there? And he says, Oh, I think there's about a hundred of them. Well, let me tell you something. <laughs> I have 171 of them. So I think there's a great deal more than a hundred, but I don't know how many more there are. I know of five others that I don't have and I can't find, but I bet you there's more than that. Wow. I love the story about them uh, being uh, torn off from the ticket stub and all of that. That's wonderful. But all of those that you have, I mean, those few that have this, the, uh, uh, the edge that where that's been torn off. Yes, I can see, but all of those others makes me wonder if they were on spinner displays, you know, at railroad stations or there. They could very well have been, but I contend that the, their scarcity is governed by the fact of that's how many tickets were sold. I see. So I, I, I don't know the answer to the questions like that, but it's easy to suppose. Yeah. 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 Well, it's an interesting thing. You know, there's so many times that you wonder how things were sold or how they were distributed. And uh, I see spinner racks, or you used to, you hardly see a rack of postcards anymore, darn it. Or maybe for sale on the sidewalk. And if they steal them, I guess they don't care so much. But anyway, <laughs> um, just uh, thank you very, very much. This has been uh, uh, lots of fun. Let me check here in the chats and in the questions. And let's see. It says, uh, Ray, have you been to Bim's Pizza? <laughs> What's that? <laughs> Who asked that question? Jenny? Jenny Michaels. Well, yes, I've been to Bim's Pizza. I've been there very, very, uh, very frequently. As a matter of fact, my wife taught the <laughs> man who runs that pizza place and who owns it. <laughs> well, fill us in and tell us more about Bim's Pizza. Why would she have asked that? I have no idea. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> Maybe she's been through Millville. Okay, okay, perhaps so. And another person wanted to know if there's a checklist. I, I thought about that when you asked me a couple of weeks ago. And you know what, with your permission, I just might create a page or two that we could include in the Wichita newsletter with perhaps thumbnail illustrations and we could create a, a, a checklist. Oh, that'd be nice. Yeah. Wonderful. If, if there's enough interest in, in doing that, I, I, I certainly would be honored to, to do it. That'd be wonderful. Mm -hmm. I'm sure Dennis Gorham would love to have one. Put, <laughs> me, da put me down for one. <laughs> there you go. There <laughs> Was you that go. Susan? <laughs> yes. Can I ask a question? Um, yes, Ray, Debbie. Ray, I stopped uh, collecting. No. Stop collecting the cards, but I, I transferred to posters, Shemenda Fair posters. So yeah, yes, well, they're big. Big yes, can they do can that. be seen from the opposite end of the train station, but I'm finding <laughs> walls for them. And actually my son is also interested in them. So you've got you've got several cohorts in the Hack Lane household. Did you hear what I said? You when stopped I, collecting them but, and started collecting posters. And I said, people with deep pockets can do that. <laughs> <laughs> I have there sources. <laughs> I yeah. wanted to say that the uh, Jenny Michaels asked, of, she was the one that asked about the pizza. And she said, get out of town. My nephew's father-in-law 
is the owner <laughs> of the pizza place. So that's her my nephew's father-in-law. Yes. Okay. There you go. Anything mm -hmm. similar for Switzerland? Not that I'm aware of. Okay. 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 Debbie? I was wondering um, if these were tickets, um, were they produced then by the French government? They were produced by the railroad administrators, yes. And so did they have like a, a several artists? Because some of them sort of looked like the same style. Um, and then of course there were others in another area that looked different, but I wondered, did they have, was there like a particular artist that produced the ones in the North and in Paris? The, the consideration in, in answer to your question is the fact that these people weren't hired because they were artists. They, they were hired because they were illustrated. These are commercial artworks. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, the vast majority of commercial artwork is never signed. Yeah. And, you know, that's, that's the case. No, the, the answer to your question is no. The, the railroads did not hire Jules Alexander Gunan because he was an artist. Mm -hmm. They hired him because he was a commercial illustrator. And they needed illustrations of, of the, their destinations, and he filled the bill. The same way with, with Maurice Troussant and, and probably others, but the vast majority of these are not signed. Okay, and there's no record of who they were? There was no record of, repeat what you said. There was no record of who the illustrators were? If there is, I have, I have no, no knowledge of it. Uh, how yes. the, uh, the the book that you mentioned to me the other day does that? Uh, he I was referring the, the, to the New Dan catalog. Do and they have? Does that catalog have detail in it? It goes on. It's volumes and volumes. I have to go through them, and I haven't done that, uh -huh. but I'll try. I'm sure there'll be a section occasionally. Maybe not in each one, but they usually f do little features. And so I'll look and I'll let you know. Well, Debbie, if there's an answer to your question and we find it, we'll make sure that you hear. <laughs> it may be in French. <laughs> it may be in French. <laughs> oui, oui. <laughs> yeah. Any if other it's questions? In French, uh, if oh, it's yes, in French, is... I can translate. Can I... something... Oh, I'm sorry. Please. Is that Dolores? Yeah. Yeah. Um, do you know anything about the other artists besides the ones that you mentioned? Because I know there were several that were signed. Well, the the answer is is the same thing I just told Debbie. I, okay. I, I'm reasonably sure that the the people who were hired to do the artwork were were illustrators, and they weren't hired because they were artists. They were okay. hired because they were commercial artists. Well, let me throw one other thing in there. Okay. I, I've, I've been trying to do a book on blotters and I've been studying the ink, the artists that did them. And mm -hmm. of course they're not called artists, they're called illustrators. Right. And at the, at the museum in Chad's Ford for um, N.C. Wyeth, he was interviewed and he was asked the difference between an artist and an illustrator. And he said the stuff that he did that was art is on the museum walls and the stuff that he did as illustrations for what he did to make his family have money so he could live. <laughs> so I don't see any difference between an illustrator and an artist. And he didn't either, except for the fact that he made money off the one. Right. So the that was sad part is that there are so many good illustrators yes. whose art deserves credit and never got it. Exactly. Exactly. I mean, just just think of all the just think of all the the magazine advertisers yes. that an artist like Maud Humphreys did. Yes. You know, or in, in in the case earlier today when when Susan brought up Coles Phillips. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, I they're, think they're artists personally, but you know that's yeah. not well known as. Yeah, I I wanted to mention when you talked about the the high speed lines in France. Uh, Who's speaking? The French have announced that the uh, next generation of TGV trains, uh, which are coming out now, are going to be going up to 450 miles an hour. 
Wow. And, That's an incredible uh, speed. I... An incredible speed. They've never had an accident in 27 years. And uh, they are amazing trains. I'll tell you one time in, in the early 2000s, Marie and I were on a train from Belgium to um, Dover. And that train was traveling so fast, I could not see the ground under the train. Yeah. <laughs> it, it, was, it was just a blur. And that train was at 168 miles an hour. Yeah. 400 miles an hour to me is incomprehensible. Yeah. That's, that, that's going to become common. <laughs> you can cross the country in an hour then. <laughs> <laughs> I have a comment. And uh, uh, Pal, is there any way you can uh, put me on the camera? I don't know. I can't tell who's even talking. This is John Adams. John Adams, right. I can see you, John. We can see you, John. I can see oh. you, John. Okay. Here we are. Uh, Here we are. Uh, Evan, I have a card that's a variation on the theme, Ray. Um, I carried this thing and had it on my board for many years, it shows. Um, and no one could ever tell me anything about it, except that it's a, it's a Japanese card that has still has the train ticket portion mm. attached oh, yeah. to it, but it's a, it's a military thing mm -hmm. with mm -hmm. military aircraft and, and uh, big armored tank and yeah. hey, very John? hard and that no one's ever. John, ever... you have a very rare piece. Oh, well, good. I've only ever seen one before. Mm -hmm. Oh. Protect and, it. <laughs> oh, thank you. Um, and I was going to ask you, Ray, do you find any with the tickets still attached? No, I no. I, I've I've seen one, but I've never been a, I've never been able to buy one. Ah, uh, okay. Yours is the second one I've ever seen. Okay. Protect it. <laughs> back in the old days, back in the 1970s, I went to the New York <laughs> show twice, and there I can remember dealers talking about and maybe being on display and so forth, menus from ships yeah. with the postcard on the bottom. You get your menu for every meal, every mm -hmm. day you're on yeah. the ship. Yes. And, uh, you know, those were cool. And I think Mr. Lauder had a complete set or was building it or something. There was a lot of, of uh, you know, hubbub and to-do about it, but it was pretty neat to hear about until you came along with this program uh, Ray, I've never heard about uh, a postcard being attached to a, a uh, train ticket. So that's very cool. I like that. It was really a, a magnificent marketing tool. Sure. Uh, you know, sure. Yeah. Yeah, very much so. Yeah. But you just think about all of the wonderful posters and advertising and brochures and things, the way they had of communicating back then. Mm -hmm. And uh, whether it's advertising a plow or a, you know, a, a trip uh, to the seashore or something. It's just uh, incredible with the artisans and the work that uh, went in to display and to market, whatever it was. The amazing Fred Harvey didn't pick up on that, huh? Well, they did. They're calendars every year, an Indian calendar from one of the Taos artists. So oh, no, well, I mean, uh, with the train ticket and the card attached, yeah. advertising his his stops and hotels and restaurants. That's right. And those little booklets, or not booklets, but little envelopes that would be eight or 10 or 12 cards, all Fred Harvey, like you're saying. Right. Very cool. Very cool. Can I ask another question, um, sure. Ray? You said that they were eight inches long the ticket in other no, words I, they were the same width as the postcard but then they were long the ticket was longer is that correct well the postcard part would have been about five or five and a half inches and then right. there was and maybe a two and a half wide ticket or two and a half inch wide ticket okay oh i see okay so seven inches all together gotcha. yeah. oh, yeah, probably okay. approximately yeah thanks just like uh uh john allen's uh 
Yeah, just like he just showed us. Yeah. Okay. Oh, I see. Okay. That. Yeah. Well, uh, any other questions or any other uh, discussion you want to do with? Ray can I just? Here? Yeah. Can I just? Can Please. I just mention something to Ray? Please. Ray, you mentioned at the start of your talk um, about Alfie Harris. I'm sorry, would you repeat that, please? At the start of your presentation, you talked yeah. about Alfie Harris. Yes. Is he a friend of yours? I should, I should say that we talk, yet we speak to him quite often. <gasps> so he's still, uh, he's still around in postcards. Wonderful. Well, not in postcards. He's sold most of his postcard collection, actually. I am absolutely thrilled to hear this. I thought he passed away years ago. No. And next time we uh, talk to him on the phone, I will mention you and your talk. Oh, please do. And give him my fondest regards. Yeah. Lovely. That's wonderful. Ray, Thank before you. we before we sign off, I wanted to... Uh, let you say uh, some words or tell about your involvement with postcardhistory.net because this is something we can all be a part of and i'll let you talk Lee, Ray. okay well well succinctly put um for the last 22 months or so I, i've been the editor of a online postcard history magazine and um a friend of mine who used to live in New York, up there near uh, Susan in Westchester County, um, he moved down to, uh, to Delaware and we had a, uh, a dinner together one day and, and he says, I want to start a postcard history magazine and uh, I want it to be uh, online and I want it to reflect the, the history that so many postcards um, represent. And he said, I'd like you to be the editor. And I said, well, why on earth would you want me to be your editor? And he said something to the effect that um, uh, I had been the editor of the South Jersey Postcard Club newsletter for, for nigh on to a dozen years at that point. And he suggested that uh, I had a lot of stories to tell. So we, we revisited a lot of the stories from the uh, old newsletters and we put them into computer language. And um, this, this fellow I'm talking about is Bill Burton. And I, I don't know whether he's with us today or not, but um, he started this magazine in, in May of uh, 2019, uh, 22 months ago. And up till uh, a, a Thursday, a week or so ago, we've, we've published 350 articles. Wow. And uh, it's um, it's been ab absolutely amazing the, the the popularity, and if I could brag a little bit, mm -hmm. I'll tell you that uh, at this point in time, uh, or at least during the January the month of January 2021, at that point in time, uh, we had 21,000 visitors during that month reading articles on postcardhistory.net. So it's, it's, a, it's a proud enterprise and, and we're very happy to be doing it. And you don't need any special memberships. Uh, you, can be, uh, you can be notified of the four articles that we publish every week if you sign up at the website uh, with your email address. Um, there's no special membership requirement. It's all free. And uh, I'm sure that each and every one of us can learn something. Uh, one more thing, I, Mr. Hahn, one, I just want to tell you that uh, there are a couple of us from the Western New York Postcard Club in Rochester, New York on. Uh, Michael Block, our president, and I'm Rick Schaefer. And uh, we really enjoyed your talk very, very you. much. Thank you. Very much. Wonderful to have this uh, great uh, outpouring here. I have uh, two sad things to, we, uh, mm -hmm. Phil mentioned it in the newsletter that uh, Marilyn Gottlieb has passed away. And also uh, Lee Brown from Sunland, California. 
Uh, Lee's been in, well, they both had health issues in recent years, but they're real fighters and hung on and made a big difference in postcard collecting. We've had a lot of fun together, a lot of laughs, a lot of dinners, a lot of being together with these both of these ladies, and we're going to miss them a lot. And I think it's wonderful that you found out that Alfie <laughs> is still alive. That, that's I'm just astonished the best news that. ever. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, if there's uh, no nothing else, I wanted to say that we uh, have another speaker lined up or we're working for a March. So stay tuned and we'll keep you in, informed. And uh, I just am so thrilled and uh, happy to have all of you here today. And Thanks again, Ray, for your wonderful presentation. It was it's great. It's been my pleasure. Thank you. Thank you Lots of much. fun. Great. Thank, Thank you. you all. Thank you. Thank Al. you. You bet. Thank you. Thank you. Good to see so many friends. You bet. It's Bye. wonderful. Bye, Susan. Thank you.